Good morning. Welcome. Thanks for being here. Um, if you haven't already, there's uh, note cards in the back of the room, so make sure to grab one. Um, this session is called Using Data to Understand and Support eCampus Students, and we have three folks here. Um, we've got Marley Perez, the Director of Student Success, Heather Garcia, um, who's one of our Instructional Design Specialists, and Catherine McAlvage, the Assistant Director of Course Development and Training. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. It's so good to see such a big group. Oh my goodness. How are we feeling? Are we excited to hear about student data? Yes. Really? Yes. All right. Well, let's do this. Um, Amy did a great job just kind of introducing. You're here to, to learn about how we're trying to use student data to better support our students and engage them in their, their courses. Um, again, my name is Marley Perez. I'm the Director of Student Success. For those of you that aren't um, totally aware of what that unit does, we're the unit in eCampus that primarily works face-to-face, -face, <laughs> virtually, with students. We're on the front lines with all of our current students. We serve anybody in an online course. So that includes Corvallis, uh, Cascades, and Portland students that are taking online courses. It includes our distance students that are degree-seeking, and also our distance students that are non-degree-seeking and just taking coursework from us to transfer back to another institution, or testing us out in some cases. So um, we work on the front lines with students. When I came in just about a year and a half ago, we started really looking at the data that we were collecting and what we were doing with that data, and we saw some gaps that we needed to address. And so we really adjusted what our assessment plan looked like for students student success and that's still in the works today we're still really trying to figure out what we need to collect and how we can use it but a couple of things came to the surface for us so number one we decided to partner with a vendor called Ruffalo Noel Levitz to administer the priority survey for online learners and I'll talk a little bit more about that that's primarily the data that we're using today to discuss how to better support students the second piece of that plan was to really revise our annual student survey that goes out to eCampus students. This is something we had been doing every year, um, and it was a really hefty, hefty survey. And we weren't getting a lot of good data, and we weren't using it really well. So we revised that, and I'll talk a little bit about that as well. And then the third piece is adding in some, some thematic questionnaires to get a little more information from students throughout the year on really specific parts of their student experience to try to really better understand how they're experiencing OSU and, and how they navigate the institution. So a little bit of background on each of those. Um, the Ruffalo No Levitz survey we will run biannually. We did it for the first time last June. Um, that focuses on all eCampus undergraduate students, so degree-seeking, non-degree, and post bac students. It measures their satisfaction and, and priorities in a distance learning environment, and it gives us some uh, national benchmarking data as well. Um, it also allows us to report back at the program level and to share that with degree programs across the campus, and we usually do that reporting in the fall. The eCampus annual survey runs every spring, and that is annually. Um, same population, all of our undergraduate students with eCampus, and really what that's trying to do is just better understand their experience in the context of OSU and what we're providing to them currently and what they, what they might need from us. That also, yes? Do you have we have a Q&A time at the end, so if we could hold them. Okay. Yeah. Um, we're using that to better understand their student experience. We can report that out at the program level, and it is something that we'll try to report at the end of summer, usually. Um, and then our thematic questionnaires are really being used throughout the year to get data on um, primarily two populations. So our students that are stopping out to better understand the patterns of why they're stopping out, when they're stopping out, if they're planning to come back, what we can do as an institution to help them re-enroll, and then looking at our coaching program, our success coaching, and, and what our students are getting from that, if that's impacting student retention and persistence, and what they need from that relationship and that service. Um, those are fairly anonymous, and so we don't report back on a program level for those, and they're ongoing, and we use them internally. Always happy to share what we find, but there's not an external reporting component to that. So the Ruffalo No Levitz Priority Survey is, is something that looks at importance and satisfaction of everything that they ask of students. And so it provides to us a gap score. So we have a really good idea of how we're performing in terms of what's important to our students. So there are things, of course, that aren't as important to our students. And if we're, we're doing okay on those, not a big deal. But if we find something that's really important to our students and their satisfaction is really low, that's something that we want to address to really try to increase um, a positive experience at OSU and hopefully increase the retention and persistence of our students. 
We facilitated it last June, and we've reported out the program level data to, to all of our majors. Um, last fall and throughout the winter, we provided those to associate deans and department heads and, and some advisors that were part of those meetings. Um, but really, this survey looks at five assessment areas. They're looking at institutional perceptions, enrollment services, academic services, instructional services, and student services. And this is just a snapshot of, of who responded. So we had um, invited about 8,500 students to participate in the survey, and we had 945 respond, which is a pretty good response rate. 72% um, of those students were between the ages of 25 and 44, which is what we expect. That's our adult learner population for the most part. 37% of those students were full-time students. So I think a lot of times we assume that our students are part-time and, and a good chunk of them are, but we forget that over a third of them are pursuing their degree full-time online. 21% um, of them identified as students of color, which is really exciting to see. I think we're kind of lining up with the campus population a little bit. And so that's, that's happy to see that we're, ser we're serving a diverse population. 90% of these students, a degree is their ultimate goal. And I think that's important because not everybody that responded to this survey is a degree-seeking student in our system. Some of them are non-degree students taking coursework, testing us out, maybe planning on transferring those courses back, but really their goal is to get a degree. So that's a population that if we can really satisfy them when they're here at OSU, they may matriculate into a full degree-seeking student. And then over 60% of our respondents were female, which is also exciting to see and, and pretty much in line with our population. So the strengths that we found from this survey, um, I've got them in two categories. So we have our OSU strengths on the left and the national strengths on the right. Strengths are defined as, as things that have high importance and high satisfaction. And the ones with an asterisk under the OSU column are the ones that are also a national strength. Um, I do wanna say that we're taking the national benchmarking data a little bit with a grain of salt. As you look at the other institutions that use this survey, um, we're definitely a different institution. There's a lot of community colleges. There are a lot of um, smaller private colleges that use this survey. There aren't a ton that are really in, in kind of the lane that we're in, in terms of distance education. As we continue to run this every other year, we hope that they add in more clients and, and some of that national benchmarking will become a little more useful for us. It is useful, but I just wanna, wanna make that, that note. Generally speaking, our, our student experience with, with services, with academics, um, with getting the information that they need, with using our website, um, our reputation, all of that, they're re it's really important to them and they're really satisfied. And I think that's good to see. We try really hard to create an experience for our students that mirrors the on-campus student as much as we can in terms of what we can offer them, how accessible we are as a campus, and how accessible our, our services are. Um, so I think that's, it, it's exciting to see. We have some work to do for sure, but, but those are the strengths that came back out of this. In terms of our challenges, again, same thing. These um, OSU challenges on the left, national challenges on the right, the ones with an asterisk are, are ones that are also national challenges. And challenges are defined as something that was really important to our students, but that they're not satisfied with, yet, yet with growth mindset. Um, right now there's a low satisfaction. And so these are the things that we're really focused on addressing in a short term and a long term to make sure that our student experience becomes even better with time. Um, I think that the, you know, sometimes when students say tuition is a worthwhile investment, that's something across the board that we see, right? Tuition is high everywhere and, and it's a lot of money that students are paying. So I don't want us to really focus on, on things like that. But a lot of it comes back to their program and their instruction and their courses and the things that they're experiencing. Um, and this is something that I see on my end. I end up being the one that fields a lot of student concerns through our, through our success team. And a lot of what our students are really looking for in their course experience is, is communication. They're looking for engagement. They really want to interact with faculty and instructors in a way um, that's similar to our on-campus students, of course different because you're doing that virtually, but they want to build a connection with their instructors. They want to build a connection with their faculty, especially in their major coursework. And so they're looking for that. And so a lot of the concerns that I feel are really about, hey, I'm reaching out, I'm trying to get this answer. I can't get in, I can't get in to see them. I'm trying to find a, a way to contact my instructor. And that's a little more difficult with their, their timing and their work lives and, and things that are going on. But it's something that our students are really craving and and I, I'm excited that Catherine and Heather are going to talk a little bit more about how, facu how faculty can do that in a really engaging and efficient way. So I'll hand it over to Heather now. Hi, everyone. I'm Heather Garcia. Um, so now that we're 
familiar with the students at Kiki campus students or more familiar with them, I want to take a look at some of the areas where first where we're doing okay according to the survey and then some areas where we'd like to improve. Um, so we'll, Catherine and I will both be focused on the area of instructional services. So here are the two areas um, that were marked with high importance by our students who took the survey. Um, and our performance in these areas were, were marked as okay. So we're, we're not excelling, but we're doing good in these areas. Uh, so it's worth noting that um, both of these survey items, uh, student assignments are clearly defined in the syllabus and assessment procedures are clear and reasonable. Both of them have to do with clarity. And in a few slides, we're going to take a look at, um, at a study where students actually ranked um, quality indicator indicators in order of importance and clarity came out on the top. It was the most important um, quality indicator to these students. So it's nice to see that we're, we're doing okay in that area. Oops. Okay. So these are the four areas um, in instructional services that we'd like to focus on. Um, quality of online instruction, choosing appropriate materials for the program content, faculty responsiveness to student needs, and providing timely feedback on student progress. So it's worth noting that um, we're not alone in this struggle. Um, uh, quality and faculty responsiveness are actually national challenges, so they're things that other institutions are dealing with as well. So in the next two slides, I'll talk about the first two and then Catherine will talk about the last two. So in eCampus and at Oregon State, we have a lot of tools to um, help us promote quality of course design and course facilitation. Some of the tools are listed on this slide. Um, and there are, just, there are many different ways to do this, but despite all of these valuable resources that we have, um, there's still a gap in terms of quality. Students are still reporting that, um, that our quality, that we could be doing better in that area. So. Uh, as Catherine and I were planning this conversation, or this presentation today, we were really discussing, you know, what is quality from an online student's perspective? Um, from the student perspective, what really, what really matters to them when it comes to creating all quality online courses? So there was a study in 2017 uh, that looked at a number of quality indicators. And these quality indicators were rated in order of importance um, by students, by faculty, and by administrators. And so you can see in the slide up here that the top three results for students, the most important quality indicators, were clarity, availability, and feedback. Whereas for faculty, the top quality indicators were interaction, engagement, and comparable rigor. So um, from, from you can see from this slide, and as the authors concluded in the study, uh, there's definitely a mismatch between what students are valuing in terms of quality indicators and what faculty are valuing. And, um, the student quality indicators are kind of summarized as, as learner support. So um, not necessarily the content, but how it's presented and how it's structured in the pacing, et cetera. Whereas the faculty quality indicators are really focused more on the content materials. So our takeaway here is that when we're building online courses, we really wanna focus on building in that support, building in that pacing, um, and making sure the content is, is clear to students and the expectations are clear. So the other, one of the other areas we'd like to really focus on today is quality instructional materials. Um, instructional materials are those physical materials that students have to purchase, um, textbooks, lab kits, et cetera. And computer-based materials would be the, the readings that they access online, videos, interactive components, um, software that they have to download. And what we know about instructional materials is that um, that a lot of instructional materials are now being delivered um, online. So as opposed to students are purchasing fewer and fewer physical materials and accessing their content online. Um, and we also know that students, they believe that we could do a better job choosing instructional materials. So some things that we, that we know about instructional materials as well is that instructional materials should be supporting the learning objectives and outcomes. Um, just as we 
we really focus on alignment in eCampus. Um, we focus on aligning our, our outcomes with our assessments. We should also really start thinking about how our instructional materials align with the learning outcomes and objectives. Um, we also know that learning materials should represent content in a variety of ways. Um, and this is a principle of universal design for learning for those who are familiar with that. But providing multiple means of representation really allows students to make connections with the learning material um, and between concepts. And it also gives them um, the ability to really exercise agency and choice to be able to, um, to choose how they want to consume the material. And then finally, um, we know that instructional materials should reflect the identities and experiences of our students. So in terms of instructional materials, our materials should really reflect different cultures, ages, gender identities, socioeconomic statuses. Um, and this is a way of really helping students to feel welcomed into the learning environment. Um, if they can see themselves in the materials, um, then they can feel, especially for our online students, maybe less isolated um, and as more a part of, of a learning community. One other thing we know about instructional materials is that students don't always use the materials in the ways we might expect. And um, as an example of that, I just want to share um, a research study. You may be familiar with it because it came from um, our eCampus research unit. And um, the study actually looked at how students really use captions and transcripts. And um, what it revealed is that 71% of students who don't even have, who don't even need an accommodation are finding, um, are using captions and transcripts. And it also found that the most common reasons were not necessarily for an accommodation, but um, for transcripts, the most common reason students were using them was actually as a study guide. And the most um, common reason students were using captions was to help them focus. Now I'm going to turn it over to Catherine. Right. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, I'm going to pick up where Heather left off, which is to talk about two more of the challenges that were revealed by the Noel Levitt survey. Um, so let's think about these challenges together, actually. Faculty availability and the timeliness of feedback. These are two highly valued items that get at the fact that students want to be in touch with their instructors and to have opportunities for continuous improvement. So whether you have developed an eCampus course with us or you're teaching one um, that is already developed, there are a few really simple steps I think we can take, um, and this might be on your own or this might be in partnership with someone on our team, to help you support students by way of responsiveness and timely feedback. I'm going to address each of these three steps in subsequent slides, but let's take a high-level look at them first. Initially, it's really critical to understand the mechanics of your course design. This means understanding the flow of learning, including where students are working through content and activities, and where intervention of some kind is needed from you, the instructor. Once you understand how the structure of learning is built across the course, you can sync your communication plan to it. And then importantly, I've noted here, you need to follow through on it, right? As a third step, you'll need to determine if things are working for your students by soliciting and then applying feedback. And of course, we're going to talk about this cycle as being iterative because as we know, courses evolve over time, tweaks are needed. And so this might be a process that you come back to on occasion. You may have heard the term scaffolding to refer to structures of learning in a course, or sometimes it's also called staged assignments. Visually, scaffolding is often represented by like a stair structure with students building knowledge and skills across a course. But scaffolding isn't always this linear, so I like to represent it as a circular structure, something like a web. The knowledge, skills, and abilities that students bring into the course are at the heart of that web, and then you slowly thread on to that structure with newly developed knowledge, skills, and abilities over the course of the course. Examples of scaffolding in any campus course might be that students post a draft of a research question before they move on to searching the library for relevant sources or that students have to learn to solve a more basic type of equation before they move on to a more complex one. Once you've uncovered what that web-like structure looks like in your course, you can look at the really practical stuff. 
the week to week, module to module, or maybe even unit to unit scheduling. In particular, you would wanna be looking for assessment points that are used to measure student learning along the way. You would then look for how much time there is for you as the instructor to provide feedback after that work comes in for students. So how long it takes you to do the feedback, return it to students, and then how much time there is for students to apply that feedback before the next deadline comes up. Obviously, you're gonna to wanna to be realistic here about how much time it takes for you to do that feedback. We know our course caps are going up, so we're really thinking practically here, but you'll wanna be equally realistic about how much time it would take your students to apply that feedback well. So that's where some of the know all of it survey data comes in, right? If students are full-time, they're working, if they've got kiddos at home, some are taking care of aging parents, they're gonna need a little bit of time. It's probably not 24 hours and then they're ready to post an updated assignment or draft, okay? The previous step should reveal the timelines that are kind of baked into your course as it stands. So next up, you would wanna sync your communication plan to the timelines that you uncovered. Your communication plan should ideally be communicated to students in three places, and oftentimes it already is, but it's something to check for. We like to see it in the Start Here module, that initial module that should be built into all eCampus courses, um, in the syllabus, of course, and then oftentimes we encourage you to send it out in a welcome email to students, that initial email that you send to your group. This is when you're starting to establish baselines and routines with your students, so let them know what your communication plan is. As part of this, you'll wanna identify things like your methods of communication with the class. So we don't want students to have to go looking for, oh, where, where should I see that? Should I see that in Canvas messages and email and announcements? Pick a plan, tell them what it is, then they'll know. Um, if there are, or I'm sorry, how you would like to respond or how you would like to receive communication. Some faculty have distinct preferences about whether students send you a Canvas message or an email or post to a Q&A forum. Let them know what your preference is up front. Um, how long it will take to respond to emails and Q&A forums, and if there are particular days of the week that you're unable to respond. Again, then students know this up front. And then of course, response times for providing grades and feedback. Now this can be an estimate, but it's a good thing to let students know because then they can plan ahead, right? The idea is to not leave students in the dark. We want them to get a sense of when they should hear from you, and then they can plan accordingly. So I have a sample calendar here that demonstrates what happens when a communication plan is out of sync with course design. And I've seen this happen sometimes when a faculty member takes over a course because they didn't get to choose the design, right? Um, like many eCampus classes, this sample schedule or this course has higher stakes assignments due on Sundays, which by the way is great, right? If we've got students working full time, they need weekends. So Sunday deadlines are a great first choice, right? Um, and in this case, there's some discussion board posts and responses due in the middle of the week. But notice the instructor communication little snippet at the bottom here. I will reply within 48 hours on business days, but I take Saturday and Sunday for screen-free time with my family. In theory, nothing wrong with taking screen-free time, right? We are equally invested in student success and faculty success. So you need time away from your screens. You need family time, that's great, right? The issue here is that the communication plan is out of sync with the course design. If a student was working full time and raising kids and needed to do that lab one assignment on Friday night, Saturday and Sunday, if they have a question, they're gonna send you that question when they have it, but you wouldn't be responding until Monday, right? And that's after the assignment is due. So that's gonna create an obstacle for that student and their learning on that lab assignment may not be as good as if they had been able to be in touch with the instructor. So here's just a slight tweak. The schedule here hasn't changed, um, and we'll talk about changing timelines and deadlines at least a little bit as options, but the communication plan here has been changed. I will reply within 24 hours on weekdays and we'll check email briefly on Saturday and Sunday afternoons for urgent questions on assignments. We have a lot of faculty moving to this kind of model. There's two reasons why. It's reasonable, right? It'll help the students if there's those Sunday deadlines, 
but also we have many, many eCampus faculty reporting that they have less stress and higher satisfaction with teaching online if you spend bits of time responding to students and being in the course site throughout the week instead of big chunks just on weekdays, like we might think of as a schedule for more of an on-campus teaching kind of setup. Okay, so if you're teaching a mid-size or a large class, I hear you, this is tough, right? So you might be looking for some efficiencies to providing feedback within a appropriate turnaround time. And here's some examples for you. I'm going to just go through these really quickly and then note that you're always welcome to come chat with our team if you want to know more about these or talk through how they might be relevant for your class. So here's my quick list of ideas for you. Use detailed grading rubrics so that you're going really quickly through the actual grading, the thing you have to do for every student and then you can spend that little bit of extra time on personalized written feedback. Create a shorthand for common errors, right? I've seen faculty do like a, here's my 20, I'm gonna be on my soapbox for a minute, here's my 20 things that my students always do and I hate, I'm gonna number 14, you go check the key and see that, oh, that's, you need to make sure that you cited an APA citation format, not something else or whatever, okay? Um, have a master document of common feedback items. So if you've been teaching your class for a while, you're probably giving similar kinds of feedback. Have a master document that you could copy and paste from. That can speed things up. And then we'd also encourage you, and Heather actually has some expertise in this that we didn't have time to put in the presentation, but there's been some really interesting research done around audio and video feedback. Um, students can respond to that really well in certain cases, and sometimes it's quicker for you to just say what you would otherwise type out to a student, okay? So there's a lot of options. We'll, we are happy to work together with you on finding which ones are a good fit for you and for your class. To just take a quickly a different approach to this, considering the type of feedback that students need at any given time can also reveal opportunities for efficiency. If you're familiar with these terms of formative and summative feedback, formative feedback is meant to help students improve along the way and should generally be more detailed, and it might require a bit more time on your part. But in cases where summative feedback is appropriate, and this is where you would be assessing learning at the end of a unit or a module or even at the end of the course, that can be a little bit more brief, right? That's backward looking, not forward looking. And so we can think about ways for you to spend time and have it mean more to students. If we're looking at that, that's gonna be the formative feedback, summative feedback, there's ways that we can have you be just as effective in terms of what students need, but spend a little less time on it. Okay, so then there's the question, how do you know, right? If you're gonna start tweaking some of these things, how do you know if it's working for your students? You're all likely familiar with some of the more common ways that we use on campus, including the ESET, though I'm hearing murmurs that's changing, which I think we're all excited about, so there's some opportunities there. Um, there's also an increasing amount of data available to you in Canvas, which I'm not going to talk about today because there's other seminars, both from us and from academic technology. Um, but I'm going to mention some other strategies and things you might want to bring in in addition to ESET data and Canvas data. One of my personal favorites, and this is not just an analytics tool in Canvas that you can click on, but is to create grading groups to differentiate discussion board activities from written assignments, from quizzes, and from exams. What that does in the gradebook is it reveals the types of activities that students are doing and how they're doing on each of those groups. And that can give you some really interesting information, at least as a starting point, to see if students are struggling with a particular type of assignment in your course. Um, also remember that you can generate your own student feedback if you choose. Custom questions can be added to the ESET but I would recommend a very short midterm survey, right? ESET data looks backwards. Class is done, nothing you can do about it. But if you give students just a really short, like a two question midterm survey, you're gonna get lots of interesting feedback and you'll have time to pivot if you need to. Um, I've linked and these slides will be available through um, the Google Drive that we have set up for all of our presentations today. The link's actually on the back of your program so you can get into these and just feel free to steal from them. These are things I've developed and used in my classes. But the first is a sample midterm survey in Google Forms. It's really short, two questions, what's going well, what's going not so well. You get a lot of good information there. And then I've also linked a metacognitive and reflective exercise that can be used to provide both you and your students with feedback about how a course is going on a more frequent basis. 
and that's something that can be implemented as like a weekly exercise or a bi-weekly exercise. I've used it both ways in both face-to-face -face and online classes and got a lot of good feedback from it. All right, to, so to close the loop on the cycle of assess, assessment, alignment, and evaluation, there's some very small baby steps you might start taking to improve your responsiveness to support students and then also give them those helpful feedback loops. You could adjust your timelines. Even if you're teaching an already developed eCampus course, you have the power to change those deadlines. If you, for example, have to spend a few extra days to get a draft feedback back to students, maybe it makes sense to bump that deadline forward on the next assignment a little bit. That's fine, okay? Um, you can adjust your communication plan. This might be something you wanna revisit and look at. Does your communication plan sync up with the course? And where is there a little wiggle room maybe on the design side and then maybe a little bit on the communication plan side? And then of course you can adjust your feedback strategy to try to create some efficiencies. One other thing I just wanna call attention to because this can be really helpful is if you know where the kind of sticky points are for students, especially in terms of timelines, let them know in advance. If you're getting feedback and there's nothing you can do more on the design side or the communication side, tell students a week in advance, hey, next week's reading load is really heavy. You might wanna get started now. I've intentionally lightened the load a little bit this week so that you can work ahead. And sharing that information with students is always good and helps them to plan. Regardless of what you do, we would encourage you to just make tweaks based on what you've learned about our eCampus students today and hopefully the information you continue to gather as you do a little bit of um, analysis of your own course and hopefully continuing to generate student feedback around items that are important to your particular course. Okay, and then, like I said before, we're always happy to help. If you wanna go through the one, this kind of exercise with one of us over at eCampus, we could certainly do that. So I think that's it for the slides. We are happy to move to Q&A now. Who's got questions? I'm gonna go sit down, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, a transcript would be, um, so captions are actually the, the captioning you see with the video, so as they're speaking, they appear on the screen. Can you hear me through this mic? Yeah, okay. Okay, okay. Um, that would be a caption, yeah. And, and captions also include um, sometimes like if there's background music, the captions will indicate that. But a transcript is usually a separate file, just a, maybe a Word document that has all of the, um, all of the speaking dialogue in, in a separate place. So captions are usually more helpful for people that need an accommodation because um, they're seeing it and they're able to read it at the same time. It's in context, whereas a transcript um, you know, a, as it showed in the slide in the study, it, they were more often used as a, a study guide. So it's something that students can maybe refer back to and read later on. Captioning, all of our videos are captioned. Um, transcripts, I, I would yeah. say that some courses use them. We try to caption every course. It takes a lot of resources to do that. So we do, to be totally honest, have a little bit of a backlog. Um, and what happens with those is we have them in a queue, we catch up on them when we can, but if a student comes through with a DAS, a Disability Access Services accommodation, we certainly get the, those get bumped to the top and we make sure that that student is supported during that class. Um, transcripts. We often, when we're designing courses, we try to get faculty to just create them and use them as they're, for example, narrating a lecture video because then that keeps you on track when you're in a recording studio and then we can just post that in the site so that one's ready to go. It's the captioning that we have to do after the fact. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Fantastic. Other questions? Yeah. 
I mean, if you think practically about it, if you're going back to study, you may not have time or may not want to devote time to watch that whole lecture video again, especially if you're looking for an answer, say, to a study guide, right? It would be much easier to just pull up the transcript, scan visually, and find the answer. So that was, a, I think, a really great finding and a really helpful one for us to just be able to know, oh, that's how students are using these materials because the way we set them up and the way we design is in some cases a little bit different than how students use them in practice. Other questions? Yeah. Um, so I don't know if you have to do another presentation on this, but um, large rack filler by hand is a big thing that comes up in this book. Mm -hmm. um, most of my students are computer science majors. Mm -hmm. So I was really curious if given that that Sure, it's a good question. Um, that's not a population that we survey, okay. uh, so I don't have data on that. There are a number of surveys that the university is doing um, that would include students. I'm, I'm noticing more and more that institutional assessment is including eCampus students, so our students are kind of um, threaded through there. But that may be something that they're looking at at the institutional level, but not something that we have. So we're happy if you want to just chat with us individually. We have a little bit of time. Feel free to come up and chat with any one of us. And what we were hoping you would do is, and I'll advance the slide in just a second, You, if you wrote down on your note card when you came in um, what your initial thoughts were, because as the three of us have been talking through preparing for this presentation, it feels like there could be a lot of ambiguity around what is this notion of quality, right? What is it to an instructor or an administrator versus a student? And so I think we've found ways to drill down into defining and interpreting that word in ways that are helpful for us in our context. Um, but I think it's really helpful to hear from you all about what you feel like these quality indicators are for you too. So we're thinking here, you know, whatever is on the front side of the card, great. That was your initial kind of gut reaction to our question. So please just leave that, don't cross it out or anything. But if you would on the back, um, and we have some examples up here of things that we've mentioned as indicators of quality in our online courses throughout the presentation. If you would just note for us, and it doesn't have to be in any particular order, a few that stand out to you as maybe being important to you based on whatever your preferences are around teaching online, or maybe they're important to your discipline or to your department. We would love to get some feedback on this because I think it will help to inform what we do going forward around training and around maybe some of these really specific uh, survey questions that we send to students so that we can collectively think about are we doing better in future years as we get more data. Um, so if you would do that for us and then there's a basket on one of the tables in the back if you wouldn't just mind dropping that in on your way out that would be great. Yeah, David? That's a great question. So there are essential standards in Quality Matters, right? The problem, and this is why Quality Matters has a lot to say about this conversation we're having, but it's not the whole picture, is that Quality Matters only really deals with design, right? So even when I send out a Quality Matter, or one of our courses to be Quality Matters reviewed by a peer review team, we send out a blank cop, well, a copy of a course that there's no students enrolled in, right? So we don't see how the faculty interacts with students. We don't see any student submissions. It's just the bare bones framework of the course. So I think we want to dig a little more deeply and certainly bank on quality matters standards. Those are really important. But also think about the facilitation piece as the follow-up to that. But quality matters really has nothing to say about. That's something we, as a community, have to figure out how to define and measure for ourselves. So it really focuses on the structure that leaves a lot unsaid. Correct.
Correct. Uh, the things that matter most to students and instructors. Yes. In some way, though I will say, like when Heather noted that clarity comes up constantly for students, that's absolutely something in Quality Matters wheelhouse, right? Things have to be clear to students. They have to know, like, one thing is, is there a button on the, or a note on the start here, the homepage, that tells students how to begin the course? That will help to make that initial entrance into the course more clear, right? Definitely something Quality Matters covers. Now, whether or not the instructor welcomes that students in the first week, responds to the introductions discussion forum, right, is responding to student emails, totally separate from Quality Matters. But thank you for noting that. I think if we can just go to kind of a higher level and what the research says, the re there's been lots and lots of research that says the more instructors engage, the better the likelihood of student success, broadly speaking, right? So you're right. We can't always account for the students who are just here to kind of get in, get out, get this over with, right? But if you can think about, and I think this is the real opportunity for online education, having started as a faculty member teaching face-to-face, I only saw my students two or three days a week, right? Occasionally they'd pop into office hours. I would try to incentivize the heck out of coming to office hours because I wanted to see them more often than just in class, especially in a lecture hall, right? Online, there's opportunities to kind of keep them coming back and ideally more than just two or three days a week, right? So I think there's ways that we can do that in terms of design, but a lot of that is, has to do with the reaching out from the instructor perspective and reminding them, right? The other thing that strikes me about what you just said um, is that students, we do know, at least anecdotally, that a lot of them are using that to-do list in Canvas, right? But we've kind of gotten smarter about this, right? Like one of the perpetual complaints about Canvas is that there's not an ability to put two deadlines on a discussion forum. How many would like that? <laughs> okay, there's a Canvas feature request for that somewhere. Please go upvote that because one of these days we'd really like to see that happen. So one way around that, knowing that students use the to-do list is to add a calendar in, or a calendar event to your calendar. It doesn't actually create an assignment. It doesn't create an extra column in the gradebook. But you can prompt students to go in and do that first initial post and then have the deadline be the last one, right? Yes. Exactly. And so I think there's other ways to do that to kind of ping students and remind them. 
The other one that has been fairly successful in a lot of our classes, and there's a setting that's really buried, is to um, put announcements in preview form on your home page. Because right now, announcements are over on the side, right? And if students have changed their defaults, it's not going to go to their own email per se. We can't assume that. But if you can just put it up there so whenever they come into the course site, the first thing they're going to see is the top three to five, you can set the number, announcements. That's another way to just get information out there. It increases your instructor presence because students see, oh, my instructor posted one or two things since I was last in the course site. And so we're, we're just thinking about these kind of sneaky ways to just they keep students, attention. yes, right? Like we know they're on their phones all the time. So we are too, right? This is not specific to the millennial generation. This is just a broad kind of cultural shift. So we can think about design and facilitation strategies to just kind of be sneaky and try to get them engaged in the course site. But that also takes the faculty initiating that engagement, right? And that's really what we wanted to call out today is I think we, we're doing really well on design. There's a lot of good things happening in our courses. We could do a little bit more around the facilitation piece and we're happy to help you be strategic because ideally this doesn't mean just spend more time. This means being more strategic and more efficient about how you spend the time you have to engage with your students. We are right at time and I do need to get you all on to the next session. So. Thank you, fellow presenters. That was great. Thank you, Amy.